Hello, my friends. Happy Thursday afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Miss Rachel at the William Jeans Memorial Library. Hello. Whoa. I'm in I'm in uh I'm I'm in an echo chamber. Um have this on my phone so I can see my comments so that I can say things like, hello, Ada. I'm so glad you're here and you're watching today. Welcome. Um, but I had to turn my volume down so I couldn't also hear myself. Anyway, um, welcome to Spotlight on Arab American Heritage. We are coming to the end of Arab American Heritage Month, but I hope that you have been inspired to continue learning more and more um, about our world, not just our country and the people in it as diverse and, and um, from so many different places and different experiences, but um, outside of our country as well, um, because it will help you understand more about yourself and your community. And um, it's just been a great um, experience for me uh, to learn and to share with you what I'm learning. And I would love to learn from you too. So if you have interesting things to tell me that you have learned or that you know, if you know something that I messed up in any of my um, programs, let me know. Um, part of what we want to do at the library is create lifelong learners. And if you are still learning for your whole life, then it means you're still making mistakes and you need um, other people to help you along the way. So we have sort of a hodgepodge of different things that we're going to look at today. And I thought I would start with um, some little interesting things that I discovered from this book. I highly encourage you to check this book out. This is called The Atlas Obscura Explorer's Guide for the World's Most Adventurous Kid. So I don't know if you think you are the world's most adventurous kid, um, feeling you might be. And so you would find this book really fascinating. 47 countries, 100 extraordinary places to visit. So this has countries from all over the world. And it has a couple things about countries that are part of the Arab world. And I'm going to share with you some interesting little things about the country of Morocco, um, which is an Arab country. Now, I showed you a map of the Arab world a couple weeks ago. I'm gonna, I don't know how clear this will come through, but See here we have a picture of a globe and it shows you where ooh, Morocco is. Now we are where? Up here, North America, and Morocco is way up here in Northern Africa, all the way across the ocean. In Morocco, um, they have gravity defying goats. Now what that means is that they climb up in trees. The tree goats of Morocco. See the picture there? Walk up to an argan tree on the road between Agadir and Esoria in southwest Morocco and peer up into the branches. A dozen curious floppy-eared goats will look back at you. Why did these goats climb the tree? They're looking for some very special fruit. Argan trees are rare, and to goats, their fruit is totally irresistible. The animals digest the fleshy part of the fruit, but they spit out the seeds. Farmers eagerly scoop up and crush the seeds to make a substance called argan oil. It is sold internationally as an expensive cosmetic product. This goat Bit economy is both good and bad. Too much harvesting farms argan trees. On the other hand, the money helps Moroccan farmers to send their kids to schools, which are often far away. So if you have anything in your house that says it has argan oil in it, guess what? It probably started by being chewed up and spit out by a goat in an argan tree in the country of Morocco. I just think that that is absolutely fascinating. 
Um, we're going to come back to that if we have time, because there is another thing that I would like to tell you about Morocco. First, we are going to um, meet some more people. We've been meeting all kinds of different people, um, different heroes with um, Arab roots. And hi, Josie. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad you're here. Um, I found two books about a really amazing Iraqi born woman. Her name is Zaha Hadid. And so I have, first I found this book, The World is Not a Rectangle, a portrait of architect Zaha Hadid. And that is the one that I'm gonna read with you today. But the other one I found, which I would encourage you to check out, this is, uh, this is new. We just got it in this month. This one is called Building Zaha, the Story of Architect Zaha Hadid. This one is by Victoria Tentler Brylon. Um, it's a different um, author, different illustrations about the same amazing woman. Um, this one is by Jeanette Winter and um, it's published by Simon and & Schuster. And um, I just, love this story because there are a lot of stories about people um, from Iraq and areas around there also other countries, Syria, that tell stories of people that um, are refugees, which we learned about, um, or fleeing from war. And I think it's important to, to note that there are um, people who are have stories to tell that don't involve um, hardship. So I like to highlight some of those people too, that um, their, their only story they have that, that our country thinks is worth telling is a hardship. No, there are, there are some things like a super cool woman who's a super cool architect who happens to have been born in Iraq. The world is not a rectangle. This one's published by Beach Lane Books. chair situated here. In Iraq, rivers flow through green marshes. Wind swoops across sand dunes and through ancient cities. Zaha Hadid, here she is right here, sees the rivers and marshes and dunes and ruins with her father and imagines what cities looked like thousands of years ago. In Baghdad, where Zaha lives with her family, she dreams of designing her own cities. Zaha looks long and hard at patterns in her Persian carpet and sees how the shapes and colors flow into each other like the dunes and rivers and marshes. Zaha has ideas. She designs clothes for herself. She arranges her furniture. She loves her mirror because the corners aren't square. There are no corners in the dunes or rivers or marshes. Zaha is a Muslim who attends a Catholic school and loves myth and still thinks about the ancient ruins. She leaves home to learn more about cities and how to build them. She has ideas. In London, Zaha studies to be an architect. If you don't know what an architect is, it is someone who designs buildings, houses, cities. If she goes to another country, she goes to England, to the city of London, to learn how to be an architect. She already loves designing things. Now she's going to go to school to find out more. She fills notebooks with plans and designs. She makes paintings of the cities she sees in her mind.
Zaha graduates with honors, rents a room in an old school building, and opens her own office. Studio Nine. A few friends join her. They work hard, night and day, making drawings and plans. We never left. Zaha's designs don't look like other designs. Her buildings swoosh and zoom and flow and fly. The world is not a rectangle. Now, I don't think this is going to come through very clearly on the computer screen, but these show some drawings. And the drawings look like buildings that you've never seen anything like before. Mostly, we see buildings that are rectangles. Zaha does not like rectangles. But no one wants to build her unusual designs. They say they can't be built, but Zaha knows they can. So she enters competition after competition, hoping to win, hoping someone will be brave enough to build them. Finally, one of Zaha's designs is chosen. The architect judges her plan is the best. But the city's committee doesn't like it. She's an Arab. This can't be built. She's a woman. And they won't build it. They hold another competition. Her design wins again and still they refuse. Hadid means iron in Arabic, and Zaha is as strong as iron. She keeps on working one plan after another. She says, I made a conscious decision not to stop. Zaha remembers the grasses in the marshes swaying and sees tall buildings dancing like rats. She's imagining the grasses that she remembers from her homeland in Iraq. And she imagines building buildings shaped like rats. Zaha remembers the wind in the dunes and feels it blowing over and around and through her desert building. Zaha looks at shells and cradles her stadium like a cocoon. Who says you couldn't build a sports stadium shaped like a shell? Zaha looks at stones in a stream and builds an opera house like the pebbles in the water. Inside the opera house, a singer is the pearl in the oyster shell. What a beautiful imagination she has. Zaha looks up at stars and galaxies and sees swirling buildings. Zaha looks at waves and sees a bridge that moves with the water. Zaha looks at the Alps and builds a museum inside a mountain peak with windows to see the sky and the valley. Zaha's ski jump reaches to the sky like the mountains. Zaha thinks of the jungle and ancient wood temples and builds a wooden building to remember a faraway war. See how she made a temple that looks like the woods, the jungle? One by one, 
Zaha's designs become buildings all over the world. We do this so you can be in a simple place and feel good, said Zaha. Zaha is so busy now that every room in the old school building is filled. Over 400 architects work in these rooms, designing, planning, engineering, and making models of Zaha's visions. Zaha says, you should do what you like. Zaha designs a dollhouse and shoes and chairs. She designs a stalactite sculpture and an iceberg seat. She says, I can't stop thinking. Sometimes when she is working, Zaha's early memories return. The beauty of the landscape, she said, where sand, water, reeds, birds, buildings, and people all somehow flow together has never left me. Still believe in the impossible. Then one night, the light in Zaha's window goes dark. She has left this world, but her architects keep their lights on, designing, planning, engineering, and making models of her visions, keeping her flame blazing bright, even though Zaha is gone. Now here, you can see all the different buildings not all of them, but some of the buildings she designed, the ones that they talked about in this book, they're in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, which are some countries in the Arab world, but they're also in Cambodia and China, which are in Asia, and Austria and Italy, which are in Europe. They are all over the world. So Zaha was born in Iraq, then she went to London, and by the time she died, she was living in Florida in the United States. So many places in the world got to benefit from the talent of Zaha Hadid. If you would like to check this out, find out more about her, or check this out, find out more about her. An amazing um, Iraqi-born woman, and um, I think she's even in this book, which we've read a couple of things from this month, um, that has more like a little, um, just a little bit of a blurb about her, but the picture books have much more information about her story. So I was excited to share with you about an Iraqi born architect. And there's another person who lived even longer ago than Zaha Hadid, who I wanted to tell you about. And he was born in Lebanon. And I think we've talked about Lebanon in past um, spotlight speakers that we've had. Um, this person lived a long time ago and he was a poet. His name was Khalil Gibran. And I have to confess, he is one of my all time favorite poets. And maybe you've never heard of him, Khalil Gibran. Here's a quote that means something that Khalil Gibran said. You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. So what does that mean? Here's an example. Mother's Day is coming up. So if Mother's Day is a day that you like to do something special um, for your mother or someone who's like a mother to you, you could give of your possessions. You could give that person something that is yours. But 
when you're really, really, truly giving, you're giving up yourself. So that could be your time. You give your time to someone that you love. And that means even more, whether it's spending time with them or spending time doing something for them or making something for them. That means even more than giving a thing. So that was one thing that Khalil Gibran, the poet, said. So Khalil Gibran was born in greater Syria, um, which is now Lebanon. Um, and there is a country called Syria, but Lebanon is now its own country. It's not part of greater Syria. In 1883, so he was born much more than 100 years ago. And only William Shakespeare and Lao Tzu have sold more books of poetry. And they were writing things for centuries. That means hundreds of years before Khalil Gibran was even born. So all that to say, he is what we call a best selling poet for sure. As a little boy, Khalil enjoyed the peacefulness of nature. He'd pare off his clothes and stand joyfully in the pouring rain. He also loved to draw, but his household was a troubled place because his father drank too much. So his mother left the home and took Khalil and his three siblings to the United States. They settled in Boston. Boston is in Massachusetts. Khalil had never been to school, so they put him in a class for students who didn't speak English, but he still managed to thrive in his busy city neighborhood where he began taking art lessons. So Khalil's sister, as they got a little bit older, gave him money to live on so he could work on his paintings and write stories and poems. A teacher named Mary Haskell admired Khalil's work. She paid his rent later in life when he moved to a tiny apartment in New York City. And they wrote long letters back and forth and Haskell edited Khalil's poems and stories. Another poet nicknamed Khalil the prophet, which he used as the title of his most famous book. So if you ever, get, when you get a little bit older, um, here of a book called The Prophet by this guy who was born in Lebanon. So I didn't read all of this, but I will say that he, um, well, about the book The Prophet, um, he wrote a poem for his fellow Arab Americans um, in as part of that. And it says, I believe that you have inherited from your forefathers, an ancient dream, a song, a prophecy, which you can proudly lay as a gift of gratitude upon the lap of America. So he believes that um, people like him who are born in the Arab world have many, many gifts and they can share those gifts with other people. And we are so thankful for people with root, roots in Arab countries who have shared their wonderful gifts with us here in the United States. So that's Khalil Gibran. That is part of um, this book called First Generation 36 Trailblazing Immigrants and Refugees Who Make America Great. And Khalil Gibran was certainly one of those. You might remember last week we learned about this basketball player who designed um, um, headscarves, hijabs, and um, clothing that worked very well for women who wanted to play sports so that they could participate in sports and observe their religion um, of Islam at the same time. So many cool gifts that we've been given from Arab Americans, and we're so thankful to have that. Um, rich culture be a part of the United States. All right. I also told you that I was going to tell you about a 
Moroccan and Swiss Lebanese American makeup artist. That is a big mouthful. That's a lot to say. This was one I was going to read to you another week and I ran out of time, but I love this story. I think it's so cool. It's from this book, Muslim Girls Rise, Inspirational Champions of Our Time. Now, not everyone in this book, just like not everyone in this book, are um, Arab American. Um, not everyone in this book is Muslim. These are um, people from all different uh, religions and backgrounds. This book has people from all different uh, backgrounds and countries, not all Arab countries or not all Arab American, but they're all stories of Muslim women or girls. So this person I'm going to tell you about happens to be a Muslim girl and she happens to be um, in a family. Let's see, one of her parents was Moroccan and one of her parents was Swiss and Lebanese and they ended up here in the United States. So she has a lot of heritage to be proud of. Her name is Noura Aspia and here's a quote something that Nora Afia said. She said, just because you don't look like everyone else doesn't mean you are less than everyone. So there are some places where Nora here might feel like she doesn't look like everyone else. If she's the only person um, in a certain group of people who's wearing a head covering like this, she might feel like she doesn't look like everyone else, but she knows but it doesn't mean that she's worth any less than anyone else. And that's true for all of us. Whether you wear a headscarf or a hijab like Nora, or whether you don't, whatever things make you different from other people doesn't make you worth any less. Let's find out some more about Nora. Nora liked to play with makeup. As a teenager in Aurora, Colorado, she rimmed her eyes with coal, spelled K-O-H-L. It's kind of like chalky black that you can put on your eyes like makeup. Over time, she began experimenting with different styles of makeup, carefully blending shimmering shadows across her eyelids or sweeping rich stain across her lips. Her face became a canvas to express herself. Nora wanted to share her love of makeup with others. She began creating online videos, which drew a lot of attention. CoverGirl Cosmetics asked her to join them in a beauty campaign. Nora stood alongside people of different races and genders to shoot a commercial on beauty equality. Her smiling face was spread across a billboard in Times Square. By being herself, Nora helped change the face of beauty in America. There was a time that anybody who was going to be a makeup artist or a makeup model, somebody who would have makeup on and be in pictures for magazines or billboards or TV commercials would not look like Nora. They would definitely not be wearing a hijab, a head covering. They would have their hair um, out and showing. And they definitely would not have skin that was a little bit darker than white skin. But she loved makeup. And so she started making her own videos without anybody paying her to do it. Just to share all the things that she was learning as she experimented with makeup. And somebody said, well, look at your very good at this art of applying makeup. And so as things changed and people began to understand that someone can be beautiful no matter what they wear on their head and no matter what color their face is. And she became famous and she made other girls who look like her, who might wear a head covering or have darker skin than just plain old white, realize that there isn't just one way to be beautiful. 
There are many ways to be beautiful. So she's considered um, an inspirational champion because young girls, especially young Muslim girls could learn that they can be beautiful exactly the way they are and they can express themselves and express their personalities in lots of different ways, not just one way. So things like that are changing. They used to be very different and now things are changing and people are becoming more and more aware of how much more beautiful and rich our country, the United States is because we have immigrants and refugees and people who practice different religions than we do. Um, I shouldn't say that we do because we are the people of the United States. So we already are practicing many different religions, but I mean more like we, like me or you as your family. There are people who, who are different than you, different than your family, than your neighborhood all over our country. And it makes it so much more exciting and interesting and beautiful. Now, if you look out over a field of grass, green, beautiful, healthy grass, it's very lovely, especially this time of year when it's all starting to grow, it's beautiful. But what makes it even more beautiful if you look over there and you see a patch of yellow flowers and you look over there and you see some beautiful purple wildflowers and you look over there and you see red and orange and purple and blue flowers all mixed together. Some are tall and some are short, some are waving in the wind and some are strong, even more beautiful. So I am thankful for all of the different beautiful flowers and all of the different beautiful people that we get to have in our lives. And even if you don't know a lot of people that are different than you, you can learn about them because there's this place, you know, where you can come and check out books about everything. Everything and anything you can think of, any place in the world, any person in the world. That is part of my job as a children's librarian to help you find books, to help you learn about things that you didn't know about before or that you wanna learn more about. So if you have anything at all that you would like to learn more about or get books about, hope you would let me know. And if you have any more questions about anything that we've learned this month about um, Arab American heritage, I will try to learn it so I can share it with you or find out from somebody who knows more than I do. And I hope you will keep on the journey, even though the month of April is almost over, keep on the journey for learning more and more and more blabbing and blabbing because I get so excited about this stuff and um, I'm hoping that you will come in, check out some books and that I'll get to see you pretty soon. If you are not coming into the library yet, we do have curbside service. We are doing still uh, book bundles. So if you'd like to, there's a form on our website where you can request, you can put the age of a child and special interests and we will get some variety of books together for you. Um, anything we can do to get books into your hands and to stay connected to you. Thanks, everyone. And I will say one more time, let's make sure I say it right, Ramadan Mubarak. We are still in the month of Ramadan. So keep watching the moon. And when it disappears, not because of clouds, but because of the changing of the cycle of the moon where we are in the month, then you will know that Ramadan has come to an end and then you can say Eid Mubarak. So for now, Ramadan Mubarak. Good afternoon, goodbye.